Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our CCMA webinar uh, with the team from Activision Blizzard. I'm going to give a couple of minutes. I see loads of people coming in. So delighted to, to see you all. And thanks for joining. Hi, JP. Hi, Mark. Hi, Anna. Great to see you. Hi, Deirdre. Uh, we have a lot of interest in this webinar this afternoon. So no pressure on Dan, who is, who is our presenter and on screen there. Uh, but I know he's going to be brilliant. So uh, we had a, a good run through yesterday. So I'm joining you from a miserable Kildare. I think Dan is in a slightly better Cork and Shonda is joining us from a lovely sweltering Texas. So we have to say a big shout out and a hello to Shonda, who is the senior manager uh, for uh, learning and development with, with Blizzard and is joining us from Texas. So uh, no envy, no jealousy at all. Just uh, wishing uh, we, we had a bit of sun over in Kildare and in the rest of Ireland, but uh, these things happen. And um, so I'm going to give just two more minutes. And um, I, I think that the, the, the interest in this topic is really due to the impact of COVID and the fact that, you know, the role of training and development departments really changed significantly during that period. And we were talking about that just before we came on air. Um, and I think now as companies are coming back into the office, some are coming back in, some are hybrid, some are fully remote the challenges of delivering learning and development and how to deliver that is, is a big is a big challenge for companies. And I think we're absolutely delighted that Dan and the team and Shonda and the team from Blizzard, and I know Anna is there as well in the background, Anna is our, our board member, uh, are willing to share really valuable insights with us this afternoon on their approach to uh, blended learning and what has worked for them. And also I'm sure they'll share what, what ha hasn't necessarily worked as well as they would have liked. So as always, um, really want to encourage you to come through with any questions or observations that you have. Um, the little button on the right hand side there of your screen, you'll see where you can put a question or even make an observation and a comment. And this really is your opportunity to speak to, you know, gurus here in the area of training and development uh, with both Dan and, and Shonda. So, uh, so please do that uh, and we will come to them at the end or if there's any burning question that comes in the middle, I'll bring it to Dan's attention. So I'm going to hand over to Shonda. She's going to do a little introduction. And uh, thank you so much, Dan and Shonda. I'll, I'll come back and talk to you at the, at the very end. Thanks so much. Hey, everybody. Uh, as we said, my name is Shonda. I've been working at Blizzard for it's a good 12 years now. Um, and I remember when Dan first started at Blizzard. Um, he was so excited and so passionate. And he was passionate about our games. He was passionate about Blizzard but also super passionate about learning and the things we can do to really engage our learners. And he comes to us as a, an exceptional e-learning developer and designer, and also really excited to not just create an impressive or a pretty e-learning. He wants to create engaging content that people will learn from. And he has been with us through our entire journey to blended learning. We, uh, we worked even before COVID to move into a more virtual environment because we had multiple locations for our uh, agents, our game masters. And we wanted to make sure that we could create engaging content, but also let people join from any location, which meant virtual. It's, it's been an interesting journey. We've, uh, we've done some things really well. We've had some things we've done that didn't work at all. Um, and I'm really excited to share Dan with you today so we can talk about that journey and some of the things we learned from it. Thank you, Dan. Thanks again, Shonda, and thanks for those kind words. Uh, so my name is Daniel Healy. I've been with Blizzard for six years now. I've been 12 years in the kind of learning sphere. Um, as Shonda mentioned, I'm very, very passionate about games. And for those of you who are unaware, Blizzard Entertainment is, or Activision Blizzard, is a um, multifaceted gaming uh, creator. We create video games for people to play and enjoy. Um, but there's a lot that goes on in the background to make that happen, uh, from engineering to QA to DevOps to customer service, uh, which is the facet that I'm involved in. Um, and I wanted to take you on the journey that we've been on with blended learning. Um, so to kind of kick us off with that, um, pre-COVID times were very, very different to how they are now, as I'm sure that's true for everyone here on the call. Um, a lot of our classroom training by default was uh, ILT or instructor-led training, um, and it was difficult to scale that content beyond the size of a classroom. 
So our, our classrooms that we would have had before would be maybe uh, eight to 12 people in Europe was like the typical st standard new hire classroom size. And if we had more hires than that, then we would split it into more classrooms, which meant more trainers. Uh, in the US, we went a bit bigger because we had bigger facilities. So our, cl our classrooms were at 20 to 30 people. Um, but even then, when we were coming up to big game launches, we were trying to hire people to be able to account for the volume that was going to be incoming. And it was really challenging. There was a lot of uh, geo local, there was a lot of uh, issues that were just present, both functionally and technically, that made it a real challenge to execute that. Another thing that we were very limited by was geography. Um, if we uh, we had a, an office in France in the past, and when we had new hires over there, we would on occasion have to send people from our Cork office or from our US office over to these locations. And that created challenges in and of itself, just the logistics of getting that organized. And um, the last thing about classroom training um, and ILT is, especially with our line of work, which is video games, um, and I'm sure this is true for many other industries as well, but the product is subject to constant change and is constantly being updated, which means as a result that our material has to be constantly changed and updated. So we always felt like we were in catch up and firefighting just trying to get through and making sure we had the most out of date content up to date by the time we went into learning. And even then that wasn't always the case. Um, as Shonda mentioned, we had started our uh, virtualization. I know virtualization in the world means something very different to what we mean it in Blizzard, but we went through a process of trying to turn as much of our content as we could that was new hire into a digital module or digital modules. Our onboarding program, when it was fully ILT, uh, was approximately six weeks full in duration, which is a lot of time from hiring someone to getting them to be productive on the floor. Uh, we started to identify modules that we could convert, um, either partially or entirely, into digital modules. Uh, as we noticed that these modules um, that we had covered in ILT, that we converted in the past from ILT to digital, took a lot less time. Uh, the amount of time it would take for a learner to complete a digital module was on some occasions almost half the time that it would take for them to sit in the classroom and be trained for the same amount and it does action a lot of the concerns we had in the past with geographical locations the scaling of content once we had a, a, a module that was converted into an e-learning it could be consumed by anyone anywhere and at any number uh, we call this process internally virtualization we also called it our year of tech debt as we wanted to carve out time in the year to specifically work on the conversion process and this was all 2019 this is the time that we had started this and we were moving into 2020 we'd started this process and as many of you know that like lovely march time in our calendars covid hit and it hit hard so with COVID and we had an almost immediate move to work from home environments, we had to become aggressive in implementing that timeline. We identified modules that were in critical needs of updates, but also flagged as modules that could be converted and we began working on those. Um, so as we began working on those, we tried to step back and ask ourselves, what learning methods are available to us? Um, and I want to take a time just today to go through like the things that we by and large use. I'm not, this list is not exhaustive and there's probably many things that are even not on this list that we do use as well. But when I was asked to put together a presentation to present to people today, I was trying to think on the most commonly used delivery methods that we use at Blizzard. Classroom training, first and foremost, is uh, what was our bread and butter for a large amount of time at Blizzard. And PowerPoint would have been the primary tool or software that we would have used, Microsoft PowerPoint, to develop that material. We would have things ongoing in the classroom. I'm not going to mention things like stationary and the beloved flip chart, which I think any trainer who is in um, a permanent work from home or in virtual setting dearly misses. I do personally. Um, but I'm not including those kind of peripherals because those would have been part of the classroom training. Uh, another thing that we would have started to use in the past as well was focus groups. Uh, so where this is where the, the learning or the classroom is not so structured. It's far loose to maybe a handful of questions that we want people to discuss. And we are there to facilitate the discussion more than to teach people. 
Um, as we branched out from that and went into work from home, we started making more heavier use of virtual sessions and the tools that we use for PowerPoint and Zoom. Um, we also made very, very heavy use of things like breakout rooms, the React up option, the emojis, the ability for um, our learners to annotate on screen or put check marks or notes on screen. So we could create the content as being something a bit more engaging rather than something static that we're just sitting back and looking at. Uh, we also made heavy use of workbooks in the past and still do to this day. Uh, workbooks are things that typically are started in a classroom or in a virtual session, but it is not, it doesn't end when the classroom ends. Typically there'll be things they need to do within the workbook, opportunities to reflect, maybe some questions they need to answer, and then they bring those to their manager or their coach where they can further engage with that material. Uh, and the tools that we use for this is Microsoft Word and Adobe InDesign, if we want to make it a bit fancier. Uh, not required, I might add. Uh, the next thing we had then was PDFs and job aids. So these are kind of twofold. One would be that we might hand these out as surplus content to people when they finish a learning. So it could be a handy little cheat sheet is what a lot of people might refer to them as, where that they can like, stick on their wall or they can have printed at their desk somewhere for ease of reference. Um, there are often times when we complete or when we conducted and completed our learner needs analysis where we say that training is not a requirement or there's no learning intervention needed outside of simply a job aid or a PDF. Um, I know that we also make heavy use of a, a kind of philosophy known as KCS or knowledge centered support, uh, having a knowledge base where people can go to and interact with. So we would be co kind of comboing PDFs and job aids with our, our live and dynamic hive mind or not knowledge centered support model. Uh, the tools we use when creating job aids would be Microsoft PowerPoint. It's actually a lot of people kind of overlook this, but you can just change the from landscape to portrait, and it's actually really easy to build a really functional and interactive PDF via PowerPoint. We'd also make use of Microsoft Word, Adobe InDesign, and Adobe Acrobat as well, uh, if we need people to make signatures, for example. Uh, video content, I think this came at a kind of a boom during the work from home period where people started to make heavier use of video content. And we had been using video content before. Uh, we use it as part of, um, for context in the gaming industry, I suppose, the way how we use it is that if there's a new game coming out or a new feature that's coming out in a game, uh, we may record some, uh, a learner or a, a learning specialist might record themselves playing the game. Um, and then they would use, we'd use Camtasia as a tool that we'd use to record that. And then afterwards we would annotate it, we'd put in additional context surrounding it within the video. So we're kind of showing people things that are happening in game and things that players might experience so that when the players contact our, our game masters, which are our agents, and they would have a better understanding visually of what this is. Um, and as I mentioned, Cam TechSmith, Camtasia and Adobe Photoshop are the two tools that we would make heavy use of when we are creating video content. Um, Lastly, the e-learning, which is kind of our, our tried and true staple, we use this as part of a quite a large amount of our new hire material is built in e-learning. Nearly all of our IP training that we've delivered in the last, I would at least say six years since I've been here has been e-learning. Um, and we use a variety of different techniques and kind of tools and tips on how to engage our employees when they're completing e-learning. Uh, from in, inbuilt scenarios to video content to explorative content, interactions on screen, voiceover, uh, accessibility options for people who are, have colorblind issues or people who are, are hard of hearing. We have uh, closed captioning as well. Um, so we have a variety of different options that we use to engage our learners and we use gamification techniques as well within our e-learning. And the tools that we use for building our e-learning is Adobe Captivate, for the actual building of the e-learning, Adobe Photoshop for building the visual assets that we, we would use within the e-learning, and Adobe Audition for the voice recording or any of the sound-based editing that we would need to do. Um, I intentionally put this up in this order from classroom through to e-learning or from you know something that would be physical to something that is purely distant or virtual, 
and because a lot of the conversations we were having initially as a team and when we were looking outside of our own company and um, a lot of people were kind of positing classroom and e-learning on separate sides of a spectrum um, and we tried to look at it differently instead of looking at it being where classroom is purely physical and e-learning is purely digital why do they need to live on opposite sides and we instead started to consider the concept of blended learning where people can have multiple options within this and we said that we chose to have blended learning as a menu um, so that instead of us when we're building a learning program instead of it being an ILT based program or a e-learning based program we instead decided that the delivery methods that we're going to use for the content should be should be based on two things. It should be based on the competence and confidence of learners, and it should be built on the nature of the content. So there has been a handful of programs that we have run in the past at Blizzard um, that have been heavily influenced by the blended learning model. A couple of examples that I can give you off the top of my head. Uh, we did a program back in 2018, so this is even before COVID, uh, it was called the Communication Toolkit Program. And this program looked at identifying people who were having issues with content, engaging with their players and whose uh, KPIs may have been lower on, on, on trend or on average than the rest of the floor. So we identified these individuals and we gave them a program that they could subscribe to. Some of this program included classroom training. And when they came to the classroom, they'd have a workbook that they'd work through. When they leave, they would take the workbook with them. They'd have some questions within there. They'd bring those questions to their manager. They'd have a conversation through coaching. The next session might be an e-learning that they do. We said that they're scheduled on their, by workforce management and they attend an e-learning module that they complete. And at the end of that module, there may be a series of questions that were kind of posed into them that they then go back and fill out within their workbook and they go back to their manager. The next time could be a video and the video could be interactive where we're asking them a series of questions and they can click on a button on the screen that would skip to different timestamps in the button in the video. And at the end of the video, we would again pose a question back to the learner that would then let them go away. And we saw a great trend in the results that we had with this program. I, I genuinely believe that the strength of this program was not on it. It was on it being blended and that it had a variety of different options and methods at which we could deliver learn content to learners. Some content would not have had the same impact. It might have been a video that we found on YouTube that was particularly poignant and we wanted to use that as a means of engagement. And instead of bringing people into a classroom and putting the resources aside to complete that, we said, well, why not just make this virtual and have it take place that way? And as we moved into other programs, um, like programs that we would have historically would have done in class, we have now made the move to change elements of them to be virtual. Our new hire program is a great example of that, where uh, we do majority of our new hire now is being done entirely virtually, but it is not just exclusively e-learning. We have virtual sessions that people take part in. There's workbooks that people need to complete. There's nesting or shadowing sessions that people get to engage their employees with. There's video content, there's e-learning, there's job aids. We're trying to provide as much of a suite to people as we can, um, because not every learner is the same. I think every trainer here, anyone in the learning sphere will absolutely agree that no two learners are the same. They're all different. And it's about catering to them in a variety of different ways. Um, when we come to recommendations and lessons learned, uh, there's a couple that I wanted to share with you today. Uh, and then afterwards, we can always open up the questions if people have more or people have different thoughts. Uh, with regards to the first one, which is virtual sessions, um, I cannot understate the impact of a producer. Uh, and a producer is, is someone who would be like Dorothy today, even who came and introduced everyone who may be helping people in the background with like technical issues that they're having, someone who's monitoring the chat, someone who is dealing with the technical aspects of the training, um, while the facilitator is going through the actual content. I actually think Shonda said this to me before and it really stuck with me where uh, when we do virtual training or virtual sessions, the two people are involved is the trainer and the classroom. Mm -hmm. And the producer is almost taking on the role of the classroom, of that physical space, albeit virtual. But it's they're the ones who are ensuring that people are coming in, making sure that they have no technical issues, is monitoring the chat, is organizing breakout rooms, 
uh, is ensuring that everything is set up and ready to go. Um, the power of that individual is unparalleled. We have had many sessions to start during the pandemic and when we were all in lockdown and we were all frantically trying to build e-learning and get stuff ready and we would be asked, oh, we need to deliver a virtual session and I might go and deliver the session on my own and I would come back afterwards and say like, that was a nightmare. That was frantic, it was messy, it was very, very hard to deal with the technical limitations because you're trying to deliver content and all of a sudden someone's having a technical issue and it's very hard for you to just I can't leave them behind. So you have to stop and pause the learning for everyone else. Uh, whereas having a producer role there means that that person can be catered to and dealt with individually while the trainer can still focus on the content. Um, I mentioned breakout rooms, but the power of breakout rooms is undeniable as well. Giving people the opportunity to break into smaller groups to discuss topics. If anyone's attended webinars or interactive sessions, they've probably been exposed to this, but if you've delivered training in a classroom in the past, at some point, I'm not saying you may have, but the likelihood is you have broken your classroom up into smaller groups to get them to talk about a point, and then you round robin or you come back, bring everyone back together to discuss what individual groups have learned. And breakout rooms, which are available in, I think, nearly every virtual platform for communication, I know Zoom certainly has them anyway, uh, as well as Adobe Connect and amongst others. Uh, are a fantastic tool that you should build into your repertoire when you are considering virtual content. Um, the second thing I would say is with respect to e-learning. Um, when you look at a class, especially if you're looking at new hire, uh, one thing that we did is we were trying to look at the entirety of a class in new hire and be like, there's no way we can convert this. Uh, there's too many things that need to happen in the classroom where a conversation needs to happen, where questions need to happen. It's just impossible for us to convert it. And what we actually said is, well, why don't we just step back and look at elements of the class, uh, elements of the lesson plan rather than the lesson plan in its entirety. And when we did that, we actually found that there's quite a number of sections within individual lesson plans that could be almost entirely e-learning. Um, it may be just a demonstration or a walkthrough. It may be just some simple guidelines or processes or policies that you need to bring through people with. And instead of just reading that in a virtual session over a PowerPoint, you could have them do an e-learning and then you still have that follow-up afterwards. Then they come back into the session afterwards, you can ask them, does anyone have any questions based on what they've consumed in the e-learning? It would be the exact same as if you were delivering the content in a class with a PowerPoint on screen and then asking them afterwards, do you have any questions? The benefit of it is that it's probably going to take less time for people to consume an e-learning than it is for them to go through a PowerPoint presentation on screen. Um, and it's also scalable. It means that you can you can make your content more modular, which means you can reorganize and reshape your training to be more effective. The next thing I want to talk about was video. Um, video as a format can be very interactive if you carve it out that way. If you have it being set where you're just sitting down and passively watching someone, that's not a bad learning format by any stretch. And then sometimes sitting back and watching something is almost encouraged and it may need to happen. It may be a necessity. There are elements that you can use within video editing software, Camtasia being the one that we use is, that I know of, where you can create something called a hotspot, which is an interactive button on the screen. Uh, and this would typically pause the learning, uh, pause the video at this point until they click on that button but you can create scenarios within video content where you can ask someone a question and you can have yes and no, hypothetically, as the two answers on screen. And if they click on yes, it will skip them to one part of the video. If they click on no, it skips them to a different part. And with both of them, it could give them content or um, context to the answer that they've given. So if they've answered no and it was incorrect, when they skip to that part of the video, the video can actually be explaining, ah, actually, this is correct and here's why. Um, or this is incorrect and here's why you, it was incorrect. And you're giving people that context, but it feels more interactive because they have to tangibly engage with the material rather than sitting pa back passively. Another option that we use within video content was guided tours. This is very particular to our industry where we're talking about gaming, but in essence, this could apply to any new tool or product that you're introducing to your employee base. Instead of having just people take the e-learning about the new tool that's coming up, you could record a video and go through the different elements that's coming up in the e in that new tool or new prospect and new, the new product. You can guide them through the materials, show them what's coming and what's changing with it. 
to go even a step further than that, you can make this a virtual session where you can have treat it like a, a stream. If anyone has ever watched uh, like YouTube live videos or Twitch, if anyone's familiar with the gaming industry, uh, you can have a passive chat going where people can interact and ask questions of the presenter. And all of a sudden it goes from being a static video content into something far more engaging and interactive. Um, and ultimately the last point that we have regarding blended learning is that it is largely a case of trial and error. There are some content that Shonda alluded to earlier that we tried to convert and we had to go off it as being, for example, exclusively digital. And when we checked back afterwards, it didn't land or it didn't have the same impact that it would have had had we just delivered the content as a virtual session. And I think it's about being honest with yourself and being willing to make mistakes and about being willing to try things. And you can always fall back on the older way you were training afterwards if it didn't work the first way around. But without taking risks, it's, it's impossible to know whether it's going to work or not. And because of that, by the time the risk taking that we were allowed to take, um, it enabled us to better hone in and identify which of our material would work better for us in a virtual or in a digital context. And that's been hugely rewarding as a fact. Um, that kind of concludes the end of my of my of my learning. So I'm happy to open up to any questions that people may have. So thank you. Great, thank you, Dan. Uh, really, really interesting. To kick off with a couple. Uh, actually, wait till I see. There's one just coming in here now. And um, you mentioned a couple of applications there that you're using, say on the video side of things. Like, are they expensive to use? Are they free tools to use? And then from your point about having a producer. You know, is it from a training and development department's point of view, do you need some group of people who are experts in the technology and other groups of people or individuals that are experts in pulling the content together? Um, I, I, can, I can say that, I mean, expensive is going to be loosely defined by every single company, right? Like what I might say is inexpensive, some other person might say is expensive, or what I might say is cheap, another company might say is not. I don't think the licenses for Camtasia are that exhaustive or that expensive. Shonda, if you could, you probably have a better understanding of the pricing. Camtasia is definitely one of the better priced softwares. It's um, much easier to get started on and get into. Adobe products are a little more expensive, um, but they do come with subscription options, which is nice. Uh, another alternative to uh, the Adobe products, which can have a little bit more of a learning curve to get into, um, Articulate is also really good and they have a storyline product that is, again, more like Camtasia. It's a little bit easier to get into for your first forays into um, recorded learning. Um, a little bit less of a learning curve to get started in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I will, I will definitely like double down on that as well because the learning curve for something like Camtasia is if you've built a PowerPoint, you can probably build something in Camtasia. It's it's that intuitive. It's that it's as straightforward as that. Um, okay. It is very very accessible in that respect. And with respect to the second part of the question, which was the producer side of things, none of us were experts going into this at all. We were all looking at like what we should do. And one thing we actually did early on was we wrote out what a producer should and shouldn't do and what a facilitator should and shouldn't do. So there is a clear distinction between the roles. So it was always two people in the same team. So I think Deirdre on this call. So me and Deirdre may have been, I may have been a producer for Deirdre or Deirdre may have been a producer for me, but we would meet up before the call and we would have a discussion saying, what do you want to handle and what will I handle? And we had a very like open and clear conversation between which who would be responsible for what. It meant no stepping on toes, it meant no awkwardness if something went wrong and you had each other's back. And that was a great feeling to have going in there, right? So if there was a technical issue that arose, I knew hand on heart that Deirdre was gonna get the sorted if she was my producer and Deirdre would have that same feeling vice versa if it was the other way around. Great. Okay. Shane, just to say, Shane, you put your hand up. I don't know if you have a question or not. If you have, just put it into the chat or the question section there. But in the meantime, I was really interested in you saying that when you moved to digital, it, it was sort of half the time in terms of delivery than uh, yeah, classroom-based training. So I would have thought if that's 
if that happens for other companies, you know, why would they not predominantly move to, to, to digital, digital training? But one of the questions was, you know, recording of classroom sessions. Is that something you recommend, you don't recommend? I think there is a place for recording classroom sessions. Um, I would often feel that like if you're, the danger of recording a classroom session where you're just putting a camera in the back and you're recording it is you were watching people experiencing that learning firsthand and they're able to interact and ask questions and engage with the, the content. If you're sitting back and someone asks a question, but based on that question, you now have a question, you have no means of follow-up, right? So you feel like, and I, I don't want to use this in, in a negative sense, but you feel like a second class learner. You're like, I don't get to ask the questions. I don't get to take part. So I think in if you're doing something like a, a webinar or you're doing something like a lecture style where someone's just speaking out like a TED talk equivalent, I think those are absolutely fantastic to be recorded because those are more monologue-esque in how they're delivered, right? The person is just speaking their mind and people are sitting there listening. But if it's a classroom where people are engaging and interacting, you need to be thinking about the learner that's watching that afterwards and what means of follow-up do they have and how are they going to be engaged with that material. And that that's the that that's where I would be, that's what I would challenge myself. If someone came to my team and said, I'm thinking about doing this, this is what I would be positing to them. Have they considered the person who's watching this six months later? True. Shane has come with this question. Daniel, how did you guys develop the internal workbooks? Um, so the internal workbooks for like our material, like uh, uh, just for, for clarity, uh, Shane, are we looking for, I mean, just as part of our learning programs or something else? I would have said in terms of delivering the training, when, when you talked about earlier about the workbooks being interactive, I'm just assuming now, but Shane, if you want to come back and clarify, just how did you actually develop them? Yes, it, um, it was for new hires, he's saying, what, what you mentioned in terms of the new hires. Yeah, so we would like be taking material that would. Um, thanks for clarifying. Yeah, if we if we were if we were looking at our material that we typically would have had as new hire material that would have been in class, that may have had, and I'm sure many people have this in their industries when they're delivering new hire material, they have an opportunity for people to maybe take a test, or maybe people have an opportunity for people to work in smaller groups, um, or maybe an opportunity for people to reflect and like have a couple of questions they need to answer. The, the equivalent of like a KC, like a knowledge check in a very, but not being marked, right? It's not being marked up for like a score at any point. Um, so this would be something where we, you might do at the start of a session. People come back into the start of your session. You say, okay, guys, or, okay, everyone, let's talk about, uh, let me ask you some questions about the things that we covered in the last class and see how well you remember them. You might have that as part of a workbook instead where people, you know, go away afterwards. Or, and it, it may not be something they're walking away with physically in their hands, right? It may be something you may email out to them like a week later. It's like, hey, I want everyone to fill out this workbook before they come back into the session next time, right? And here's your time off cue. Go do it, right? And people have an opportunity then to sit back and mull over the content they covered before. How we build it? Microsoft Word. I mean, there's some very simple tools. You don't need to go into the crazy expensive route. If you want to have something that's marked up and looks really pretty and polished, I know Shonda alluded to me having uh, polished content. Um, you can go polished by using things like Photoshop or Adobe InDesign. Uh, Adobe Acrobat lets you put sections on a PDF that people can click on and fill out. So, and uh, Acrobat is free as a tool. PowerPoint is free by and large. If you have an office suite, most people do. Uh, Microsoft Word is free. If not, you can use a Google Docs or any other platform there. There's a lot of tools that are at people's disposal. They just need to think a bit, a bit more outside of just the box of how it's typically used, right? Brilliant. Okay, another question from Anne-Marie. I don't know, Shanda, if you want to kick off on this one. How long did it take to go from delivering using classroom training only to blended learning? And then the second part of the question was, is was it gradual changes completed in stages? It is definitely was completed in stages for us. We um, were constantly, as Dan had alluded to, updating our content. So what we chose to do, we, we didn't have time to tell the business, do you need to just stop hiring people for like a year? Because we're going to change all our content. That's, that's not how call centers work. So what we did was we just tackled modules. A lot of our early stages were actually just taking content that was now outdated. And as we went to update it, we evaluated whether or not it could be uh, digital. 
as we started getting our feet wet, then we started really looking through our content. We took a couple of months uh, at one point a while ago now and looked through all of the content that we covered and started highlighting which modules we thought were um, conducive for translated e-learning, but also looking at which ones that we absolutely wanted to keep as in-person. And then we started implementing those ones. I, I will say we had this really good plan and then COVID hit and suddenly we were virtual um, and that did rush quite a bit of our content. Um, during the initial shutdown stages, our business was going through transformation. Everyone's suddenly working from home. And we were working overtime, updating some of our content to transition some of our classroom content to work through the virtual environment. You've, you've got to change your activities. You've got to rethink everything about how you interact in the classroom when you move virtual. And it, it was a lot of work that first year, um, but we're definitely seeing the benefits. We are now fully virtual. Um, we're happy with a lot of where our content is, even though we rushed through it in the end, we still make polished content changes. But I, I definitely feel like it, it was worth doing in stages because then we could adjust quickly. We had content we knew worked. We could try a couple modules here, a couple modules there, see whether it worked or not, take those learnings and continue. I think and can you the, give me... Sorry, sorry go for, ahead. The, for the time element as well, I think our e-learning is down to a three or four week plan now as opposed to the six week one that it was before. So we've shaved off quite an amount of time. And if we're looking in pure business numbers, which I'm sure like in learning, we're one looking at, you know, making sure that people are as ready as possible, but the business is like, we need the people to start taking the tickets or doing the calls or working the product. Um, they're wanting to get us this number down. So for us to be able to go back into business and say like, yeah, you can have them two weeks earlier is like a massive win um, yeah. for the business as well, right? Um, so yeah, it, it's investment up front and it's um, it's time and you're trying to work out new tools and it's, it's a bit scary, it's a bit uncertain, but the benefits do more certainly outweigh the, the costs, I would say. Quick, a couple of quick fire questions, I'm conscious of time. Can you give an example of what you consider to be suitable for virtual versus, a, a, you know, a type of training? Is it sort of on hands, hands on skills that weren't suitable for virtual or for, for digital? Uh, good question. It, you know, it, it, it's not just a simple list, but I would say the biggest things that we found as conducive, if it's content that we typically deliver the same way every time, it wasn't constantly changing. In our business, teaching about the games that we play, the games keep changing, but content that didn't change much over time. And also what we were looking at is when we taught it in the classroom, things that we didn't have a lot of interaction from, we didn't have a lot of questions. It tended to be a little more lecture heavy because we just had to give them the content that was one of the easiest things that we could grab and move into a digital format it isn't confusing they don't have to talk through it um it's definitely the easiest to get started on once you get into content you need to talk through or synthesize in some way the transition is much more complicated you need an interactive module now which is going to be a little more um, expensive uh, time consuming to build those ones came a little later. Um, and then there's some that we just decided people need to talk about it. They have to work through this. They need to discuss it. Um, and that's the stuff we've truly kept virtual. And Dan, how important is gamification in terms of people going through the various modules and you know getting the rewards or whatever the tags? I know obviously you guys are experts in gaming, but on the gamification side of, of training and development, how crucial is that for to bring people along the different stages? I think there's there's always a there, there's like different levels or flavors of gamification you can do right we're not saying you have to have a bad system for everything right because that could be exhausted as well mm -hmm. and there'll come a point as well where you want to stop it being extrinsic um just you know here's your reward because you've done this thing here's a badge you want people to feel willing to go through it themselves that they they have a hunger for the knowledge right? and that's obviously the place where you always want people to get to um some of the easiest things that we have found in terms of gamification is having a character that they follow along with and that character evolves on the journey. So you can have a simple character that starts off the start of new hire that's green, just like the person that you're there with. <laughs> and then as, as they're going through the learning, you're going through with this character and you know, you're helping to gear them up or give them little achievements along the way. So it's not like a badge for you, but it's a badge for your character. And people become far more invested in the character than in themselves, right? Anyone who plays a video game and they're they they're playing through the level, they they level up. It's a great they're you get a big dopamine rush. It's a big excitement factor. But 
it changes nothing for you. It's just the character that gets everything, right? So you you become intrinsically motivated to extrinsically motivate the character. It's a weird philosophy and a weird brain science to it, but it works. Um, so I'm thinking come... here. I'm thinking here, Dan. How do you relate that to a couple of our audience are in financial services? So how do you equate that to people in financial services? It could be somebody going through the process, I suppose, of applying for a mortgage, and you know, how, as you go through it, or something like that. Exactly. I mean, you could have like you know, have the person that's coming there be someone who's like, I'm helping out like a customer trying to go through a mortgage, and here's the things that I need to know so I can help them out, you know. And then you're following through with that person and. At the end, they might get a little pin or a badge or a award or a certificate, right? Something strange, but it's not for. I don't. I don't. I mean, this is probably a hot take. I don't think many people care anymore about like certificates of completion. I think that was great when you had an office space where you could hang them up, but like, yeah. no one's gonna see them anymore. So uh, I think people become far more invested on like a character they can engage with and interact with, right? Okay. Um, so that would be my take on it, but and that's a light take as well. So brilliant, brilliant. And last question, Shonda. I mean, obviously you're joining us from the states. You have a global role. Is there anything you're seeing in the future in the area of training and development that you know for the Irish audience here today they should be thinking about? You know, obviously Dan has covered in great detail. You know, the, how you've evolved in Blizzard. But is there anything you're seeing out there that we should be getting be be aware of and be preparing for? That's a very big question. Um, you know, some of what Sorry. keeps me up at night now, we we did our transition, we're trying to move to virtual, we're trying to, you know, be innovative. But some of what I keep looking at for the future is understanding what our future landscape is going to be. We had long discussions over this last year for customer service at Blizzard specifically. Are people going to be in office? Are they going to be at home? Are there going to be a little bit of both? How do I teach a training class where some people are in the office sitting together and some people are at home. These are, are things I think all of our companies are going to be struggling with and, and we don't all have answers to. Um, we're working through this blended model and trying to make things virtual and, and some more individual learning to try to combat that. But um, that's something I, I really am interested to see over time is uh, tracking engagement and, and whether it varies, uh, hybrid mm. versus remote. Um, I think it'll be really I, interesting to watch our industry in the next few years. And I think an interesting thing, and we talked about this before we came on, is maybe monitoring people that have been onboarded with these new ways of training and see, yeah. you know, do they stay longer? I mean, I know there's lots of other factors in terms of why somebody may or may not stay with an organization, but is there, is there a factor there in terms of how training was delivered or, de or developed? Yeah, um, we're, we're tracking it, but it, it takes time to get that kind of data. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks so much for that. Um, conscious of time, we've literally two minutes to go, and I know everybody's really busy. A um, couple of things to, to shout out. I know myself and Dan spoke yesterday, this is just for the audience today, that if people are interested in coming together as sort of a training and development sort of special interest group, uh, just drop me an email, and that's something we might try and facilitate over the next few months. And when we've done that before, we've done it for workforce planning, we've done it for uh, quality assurance. It's just a way of getting people with similar roles, similar challenges to meet, obviously, all online. Um, and just make a nice network and just it's somebody that you can pick up the phone to. I know Dan and Shonda have both generously said that if anybody has follow-up questions from today, they're both available on LinkedIn, so you'll track them down pretty handy. But if you can't find them, just drop me an email again. I'm happy to do that. And uh, the recording from today's webinar will hopefully be available in the next day or two. Uh, and also, I know, uh, Dan, you're going to share a version of the presentation with me as well. So can I just say, Thank you so much to both of you. Appreciate, uh, Shonda, your time. Dan, really appreciate all the, the work and effort you put into today's presentation. You did a super job, as I knew you would. So uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, and the last thing from a CCMA perspective to say is we are actually going to be having an event hosted by Google on the 26th of October. And it's actually a breakfast briefing where we have four or five industry experts talking about these new ways of working. To Shonda and Dan's point about how we're now catering not just in training and development, but in other parts of the business um, on, uh, on, on working and getting these blended uh, working uh, ways, ways of working to, 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 to work, excuse all the puns and the use of the word work. Um, but keep an eye on that and that the details are up on the events page. I think it'll be a really good event. Uh, so just to spread the word on that. But uh, thank you so much. Greetings from Kildare to, to Cork and to Texas uh, and hope to see you all again soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.
Thanks, guys. Uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. You're very welcome. That was fun. Thank you so much. We're running. Oh, no, great. And and thanks a million. I really appreciate the time. As I said, uh, it was really, really enjoyable uh, and really valuable insights there. So so thanks so much, a million, Dan. And Shanda, lovely to meet you. Hopefully we might get to meet you in person soon at some stage. <laughs> I hope so. I hope to make it out to Ireland someday. Bring some weather with you. Oh, yes. Yes. And I'll bring some of the rain back here because I could show you some rain. <laughs> Listen, thanks a lot. Take care. See you. See you, Dan. Thanks. Bye now. Bye.